All right, great. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> Sorry for that delay. Um, and so I wanted to share a proposal for how we could build an asset-backed dollar and what that would look like. Um, but before we get into that, I want to start with the question of what is money, right? And we sort of have this dollar bill, is we have monopoly money that we can convert to real world things, right? So we can take three of these and convert it for a coffee, we take one of them and buy a pound of apples, 50,000 of them and buy an electric car, or 250,000 of them and buy a house. But if I were to go to Tesla with 50,000 monopoly dollars and say, here's my $50,000, please give me a car, they're probably not going to uh, comply. So money needs to be backed up by something that is redeemable for value that we can exchange to use it as a medium of exchange. So if we look over like the last 5,000 years of human history, we've traditionally used gold or silver as the backstop for money that powers it to be used in transactions. So if we imagine this one monopoly dollar that was redeemable with one 1,700th of an ounce of gold, um, we now have something with gold that's powered by belief network effects. So people believe globally that gold has value. Gold has itself limited supply, so there's about 205,000 mine tons. And gold has low inflation. So every year we mine about 1.7% the total supply of gold um, every year. Um, silver is pretty similar in that its inflation is about 1.3%. But since 1971, um, all of uh, US dollars and all global dollars has been based on the full faith and credit of the US government or other governments. And what's kind of interesting is that this is similar to gold or silver in that you have belief network effects. So people believe globally that a US dollar holds value and you also have limited supply. So right now, there's 22 trillion US dollars in circulation, and if the US were to suddenly increase that to a quadrillion, you'd get massive distortions in pricing. Um, the problem, though, that uh, we have with uh, backing our currency with the full faith and credit of the US government is we're now in a period of pretty moderate inflation, where every year the US is increasing the supply of dollars by 6 to 10%. And so if we get into the problems with the US government backing a dollar, um, historically, gold and gold-denominated debts have kept governments honest. So if a government is buying uh, or is building a new road or is proposing a new government program, um, they have to <clears throat> pay for that in gold, and if they borrow money, uh, more gold in interest payments. But, um, and so if you're in that regime, um, in order to pay for that road, um, the, the government either has to increase taxes or decrease spending in order to cover that expense. But since 1971, when the U.S. closed the gold window, there's now sort of a magical third option for governments, which is they don't have to increase taxes, they don't have to decrease spending, and they can just print more money. So basically, for 47 of the last 50 years, the U.S. government has run a budgetary deficit and has 31 trillion in current debts and 140 trillion in unfunded liabilities. So if you just look at the 31 trillion in debt and you're paying a 4% interest rate on that, just the cost to service the US's debt is over a trillion dollars a year. And then on top of that, um, the US has a lot of government programs like Medicare and Medicaid for its citizens that it currently doesn't have funded. So the problem is that basically unlike gold or silver, which is hard to create more supply, the U.S. is very incentivized to increase the supply of dollars and to continue, continue doing so until the entire system bends to such an extreme degree that you get distortions or the system breaks entirely and people's <clears throat> faith in the U.S. government and the dollar goes away. So the problem is it's not just the U.S. that's doing this. So this is over the last 20 years, the average M2 expansion for the top nine currencies in the world. So the U.S. is about middle of the pack. Ch uh, Japan is one of the fewest uh, in terms of increasing their monetary base, and China has been about 16% per year for the last two decades. So it's not that just like if the dollar fails, we can shift to another currency because basically every government went off the gold standard at the same time and has been in this sort of increasing amount of money printing. Um, so if we think about new ideas for backing the dollar, so if we move away from a gold or silver standard or move away from backing from the full faith and credit of the US government, we could back it with something like Bitcoin, 
which is similar to gold or silver in that you have a limited supply and belief network effects. Uh, you could back it with something like farmland, which you know, there's a limited amount of land on Earth, and it also produces utility. You have commodities, so you know uh, they're pretty good inflation hedges. Public equities that are actually creating new value. Uh, real estate, which is sort of a inflation hedge, plus it generates rents. Bonds, infrastructure, and private equity. So the idea is we could uh, you know, base a new currency on one of these major asset classes. But if we look to you know, how people have thought about capital allocation for the last 100 years, um, no one would construct a portfolio that's 100% gold or 100% oil or 100% real estate. You know, some of the smartest asset uh, managers are constructing diversified portfolios. So in the case of Harvard Endowment, which is about 53 billion, um, you know, the, the managers are essentially acting like stock pickers. Uh, but for asset classes. So they're saying, you know, we think that a 20% allocation to U.S. equities, a 15% allocation to uh, foreign equities makes sense, whereas like CalPERS, which manages almost half a trillion dollars, is saying we want a 51% allocation to equities. So <clears throat> I've been thinking about this for a while and, you know, thinking about what could be better than an actively managed approach. And what's kind of interesting is to, if you're, sort of taking the ideas of an S&P 500 index fund, you know, what would a market-based approach to determining allocations for a portfolio look like? So this is currently how wealth is stored in the United States, uh, and then it's pretty similar globally, but in the US, about 52 trillion is stored in bonds, uh, 44 trillion in public equities, so stocks, 33 trillion in single-family homes, 32 trillion in private companies, um, 22 trillion in just cash, uh, 15 trillion in infrastructure, 10 trillion in commodities, and then it sort of gets smaller as you go down. But these, these are the major asset classes. Like this is where people are actually currently storing wealth. Um, so any sort of R token that's based on real assets will be some combination of these major asset classes. And my hypothesis for what would back the asset back dollar is simply a portfolio that is like an S&P 500 index fund, but for all assets and all asset classes. So you basically take, um, so fixed income or debt, which 23% of global wealth is currently stored there, that's your current allocation in the basket. So what this would currently look like is you have about 23% fixed income, 19% equities, 14% single family homes, 14% private equity, 10% uh, cash equivalents, 7% infrastructure, 4% commodities, you know, and then commercial real estate and ag and a little bit of other. And what's kind of interesting about using the market to set the weights versus institutional allocators is that as something like cryptocurrency grows from a third of a percent of total wealth to, to 5%, say maybe in two decades, um, the sort of wealth index would be tracking that. And to give a context for like why you would want to create a portfolio that mimics global wealth, uh, is because global wealth is a very like, interesting phenomenon. So since 2000, total global wealth, so that's like every asset that every person in the world owns, has grown from 100 trillion to over 400 trillion. And what's kind of interesting is that this is denominated in dollars. So this doesn't mean that there's been a you know, increase in 4x in global wealth over the last two decades. It really means as, uh, we've had about that much dollar devaluation. <laughs> Um, but what's interesting about global wealth is you get about 6 to 7% annual increase uh, with very minimal drawdowns. So if you think about what's happening when global wealth goes down, uh, if something like equities goes down, people are taking money out of equities and going to cash or going from cash to bonds. And so money is kind of moving between these plots of value. But the, uh, the wealth index fund is basically mimicking how global wealth is structured versus like if you go to like Harvard or CalPERS, they're, they're taking a specific thesis that's overvaluing equities relative to their share of wealth. So they're, they're implicitly making an assumption about equities that, you know, as, <laughs> as the recent crash has shown, might not have been like over, overly bullish on equities. Um, so to, to put this all together and look at sort of how an asset back dollar would maybe differ than some other um, R tokens is not only do you have something that's a medium of exchange that can be used to buy real, real world goods, but you also have something that's preserving and creating wealth. 
So in the case of like fixed income, you're generating yield. Public equities are getting more valuable over, over time. Single family homes, you have sort of wealth preservation plus the rental income stream and similar with other asset classes. So if we flash forward a decade, you know, now for two asset backed dollars, you could buy a coffee. You know, for one asset backed dollar, you can buy two pounds of apples and that Tesla is now 35K. Interestingly enough, the house would probably be about the same price because like it's an asset that is pretty resistant to inflation and like 14% of your portfolio is like a distributed basket of single family homes. Um, and then going forward to 2042, you now can buy a coffee for a dollar, which in the US would be very uncommon, uh, three pounds of apples and buying an electric car for 20K. So what I really like about this is essentially, uh, even if someone has no background in investing or institutional uh, capital allocation, you're giving them access to a portfolio that's tracking how uh, global wealth shifts over time. Um, and something that just holding dollars increases their general purchasing power every year um, instead of just staying neutral with inflation. Um, if we wanted to turn the asset backed dollar concept into an R token, we need to tokenize the underlying asset classes. So one way we can do that is like, let's say for US single family homes or single family homes in Latin America, you form a legal entity that owns about a billion dollars of single family homes unlevered. You then take that company public uh, with like professional management and then that publicly traded stock can be tokenized. Um, so you sort of put it like at the level where all of the laws uh, comply with like US or local regulations, but the ownership uh, of that publicly traded stock can be tokenized. You then can take the tokens from every asset class and merge them into an R token based on their pro rata share of total global wealth or total US wealth if you're doing that. Um, and to rebalance annually. Um, some open questions that I, you know, this is an idea I've been noodling on for a little bit is I, I wanna actually rigorously back test this to 1920. So understand how, you know, compared to like a 60-40 portfolio or other actively managed strategies, if you just use the percent of total wealth to weight the fund, like how that performs through various bubbles, right? So if in like 1929, you'd have a pretty high weight to equities uh, as you go through the Great Depression and just seeing how it performs through multiple asset bubbles. And then the main thing you wanna do if you're using this R token as a currency is determine the maximum drawdown values for daily or weekly or quarterly. So you know, in the case of like Harvard or like a pension fund, they don't care if there's like a 20% dip as long as overall it's increasing. But someone that's holding an R token would really care about that if they're trying to pay rent next month. So um, if, you, if we find that basically there's too much volatility with the index as is, what you can do is you can wait basket items by their market cap and the inverse volatility. So something that's more stable like infrastructure would then get a higher weight in the basket than say equities. Um, and then the goal is to compare that to other passive and active asset allocation strategies. Cool, thank you.